a very good evening to all of you and uh, welcome to the resource person this evening uh, arti ashok assistant professor cochin university of science and technology and all the participants and also the members of uh, my team uh, dr irfan abbas mr srinivas rao mr nagaraj ms vaishnavi and many more well uh, those who joined afresh today this is the 14th lecture in the online series called know your ip designed by the ipr chair sponsored by dpiit to the usmania university hyderabad and we have covered number of areas some conceptual many emerging during the last 13 lectures and i am sure that all the participants have certainly learned certain new things by now today we have requested professor arthi ashok to deliver a lecture on the protection of computer programs and the ipr issues relating to the same and we thank her for uh, readily accepting our request before i request ms arthi ashok to commence her uh, lecture it is my bounden duty to say one or two words about the topic that is the protection of computer programs which is a fast and emerging area i remember last time when i met her in uh, vit madras campus probably she was speaking on the same subject so i i am very sure that so many developments have taken place during the last so many years and she would be covering all of them i am very sure because she has been a prolific writer and uh, i have seen the google citations uh in fact uh, she she has uh, contributed a lot in various areas of intellectual property rights a formal introduction probably shared with all of you is that miss arthi is a, an assistant professor in intellectual property rights in the school of legal studies cochin university of science and technology cochi and she also worked as a research officer with the mhrd chair on ipr established by the government of india at cochin university of science and technology for uh, more than one year and also worked as the assistant professor and faculty of ipr at idaytula national law university raipur for about more than two years she completed her llm with second rank from qsat cochi in 2010 with specializations in intellectual property laws and labor laws and llb from mahatma gandhi university in the year 2008 she has an impressive track record and for her contribution in academics she received dr v keshavan kutti memorial gold medal and certificate of merit for securing the second rank in llm examination in the year 2010 an advocate mm cherian memorial gold medal and certificate of merit for securing the highest marks in labor law in llm examination in the year 2010 then certificate of merit for excellent performance in llm examination in 2010 by sharada krishna sadgamaya foundation for law and justice formerly justice we are krishna iyer foundation for law and justice she has published extensively on different aspects of intellectual property rights in the national and international journals and including springer and also acted as resource person and presented number of papers at the national and international venues including smu that is singapore management university and uh, she completed number of online courses from foreign universities and institutes like the wipo the university of edinburgh the hong kong university of science and technology etc ma'am these are the participants 
who have been with us for the last 14 weeks they include mostly the law teachers law researchers some practicing advocates and also the students hailing from different disciplines this will be a wonderful experience for them and i am sure that your uh, presentation will enrich all of us over to you ma'am yeah. thank you thank you for that uh, very warm welcome sir and uh, i'm privileged to see the audience it's a, a, a great platform for me such a vibrant audience and uh, ready sir has asked me to talk on the topic today on protection of computer programs and uh, this is not a very uh, an area which can be classified as either black or white there are quite a lot of gray areas and the law is developing its own way mm, the implications of the technological developments are quite heavy making it extremely challenging as a uh, law student uh, the presentation will initially look into uh, what is the meaning of software what are program what are the different kinds of softwares that we use today on a daily life all of us even today we are communicating with the help of uh, information technology with quite a lot of softwares in play so the current technological developments uh, through how we classify software we'll just look into then we will move into how and why the legal protection was necessitated and what was the initial uh, play regarding how to protect computer programs and we'll then go into how factually it is being protected but with particular reference to the indian law so this is the structure of how uh, how i have uh, set the agenda for the day the the topic is titled as protection of computer programs now usually uh, when we use in colloquial term and in legal term also we use these terms both program and software quite often interchangeably but from a technology point of view they are not basically one and the same software and program are two different uh, units when you say a software it's actually a set of programs so basically when you are talking of a software and protection of a software in general we are not talking about a single program but a handful of program which work together to attain a certain objective now i have i have start with this term software because particularly when it comes to uh, patent protection you have this term being commonly spoken about than the term program though legally you will see the term program quite often now even in the uh, legal sense the legal the law the ip laws do not define software there are other laws for example the information technology act have a definition for software but if we restrict ourselves to the intellectual property regime in india the term software is not actually defined but under the patent law we have a computer related inventions guideline the latest guideline being in 2017 it has the term software and it has taken the explanation from the oxford dictionary saying that software is a set of programs which is used to uh, operate the computer but then if we go back to the primary unit which is the program we probably most of us have an understanding as to what program is at least in school some of us might have learned some kind of programming language could be fortran or c++ or java uh, so you understand that program is essentially a command a technical command which is written with a particular objective in mind the objective being make the computer work in a particular fashion that you desire so that you get a particular output so that is a common understanding but when it comes to program we have a specific definition the copyright act has defined it we will go back to this definition again when we are going into the indian law but uh, again the notion the legal notion is much in line with the technical understanding that programs are a set of instructions which helps us to make the computer achieve a particular technical effect from there we will look into the ways in which softwares are basically classified now the for the purpose of our discussion i have taken the classification based on their function and based on their function softwares are broadly classified into system software and application software now when we take the examples we realize how much we are familiar with these though the terminology might not be very familiar to us 
but system software and application software both are in use now presently when we are communicating now when we look into what a system software is as the name probably suggests it's something which helps the hardware to function so all the softwares which are essential for a particular hardware to behave in a particular fashion all those constitute as what is called as a system software so at every point of time when an electronic device when an information technology device is running the system software is actually working behind it from the moment you switch on to the moment your computer shuts down the system software is at function constantly is at function the basic again system software is divided into these three categories the first being the operating system which most of us are very familiar with uh, and um, for the purpose of this you also need to understand your mobile phone is also a computer in information technology terms and all the softwares that we are talking about is equally present in our phones also the uh, smartphones that we are carrying around today so when we are talking about operating system you might be familiar with and very comfortable with multiple operating systems today so laptops we might be familiar with windows uh, or even linux or ubuntu whichever is the source you are using in our hand, in our mobile phones particularly you are familiar with android which is the operating system that a large percentage uses but then if you are using a iphone you have mac os so there are uh, operating systems in every kind of uh, hardware that we are using today apart from that we have drivers uh, device drivers they are generally attached to a, a hardware again but then the purpose of those softwares is to create a link between the main hardware and the particular hardware to which that device is connected for example your usb drive has a software inbuilt if you want to use a, a bluetooth uh, phone a, a bluetooth um, mouse, you have a a small like or it is an actually an usb a, a small device which you have to put into the slot of your system and then you use your mouse uh, so a uh, wireless mouse so that whatever that you enter that contains a software that creates a technical link between the mouse and the uh, the computer that you are using so that is a a device driver it connects two devices and similarly you have a firmware firmware again is inbuilt in every hardware and it has stored all the information that are essential for the system to work so these are all together called as system softwares essentially without these your hardware will not function so there is one major category of softwares of program that we have and require protection now uh, then we have what is called as programming language translators uh, this again is a system software itself because when we write commands as human beings when we write commands we write in what is called as high level languages Uh, you might be writing in C plus plus or Java or Fortran. That is something that we can understand. But then the machine understands only binary languages, which is zeros and ones. So this program that we have written needs to be converted into zeros and ones. And you have a software called a, or a program called a compiler, which does this. So every system also has a compiler, so that the programs that we enter is converted and translated to the language that the machine understands. and then there are certain uh, softwares the purpose of which is to do certain kinds of functions particularly the antivirus software we use it's to check for malware in the system or the malware that we probably download from internet and winrar uh, is a you are familiar with it it's used to uh, compress data so that we are able to store large amount of data so these are the different kinds of system softwares but coming to application softwares these are non essential software so even if they are not there the system the hardware would function but then these applications make our lives much easier they do a lot of functions and each of them might be doing specific functions so you you will need to have multiple application softwares for doing different functions 
and this the best example of it is the apps that you download for, from your play store today all the different applications we see is that take the example of microsoft office or uh, the web browser so it's possible to have a system without a ms office but having ms office makes our life more comfortable and we function on it it's the same with any take another example of a gaming app uh, which you download on your phone which you use to for which you can have any kind of gaming app so even without the gaming application your system works your phone works but with that you get to do a particular function which um, enriches your life in multiple ways it could be the enrichment could be on your cultural and entertainment side like you are downloading a app which is a, a ott platform for viewing movies or it could be games or it could be doing technical task it might not be enriching your cultural life but could be enriching your edu the educational part of your life where you get to read books uh, educational material and stuff so applications basically can be of any kind of functionality and this is again something we use on a day to day basis is the relevant that leads to asking what is the background that led to the protection now when at, at beginning of every technology the number of units produced would be very few and with computers the units were very few and they were very huge uh, so and initially specific or uh, computers were being created so the computer was generated or created for doing one particular task and it was being created by huge manufacturers like ibm and they couldn't make it quite a lot so it was with the hard the hard drive the uh, hardware was being created for something and to do to make that hardware behave you created specific softwares so initially the question of protection was not a huge problem because it was not easy to create such hardware but subsequently when we started making general purpose computers what you call as personal computers or pcs it could be made available to quite a lot of people and then you started having quite a lot of different programs of course the system softwares were being created initially but quite a lot of application programs also started growing so it's this growth of proportion of uh, the hardware and also the software and the realization that this software could have a huge market impact because of the easiness it causes to the life of people who have this technology with them is what uh, required the protection for software uh, initially again the person or the entity that was making the hardware itself was making the software for example ibm they are the one of the leading even today the leading market players in hardware manufacture and they were making their own softwares but subsequently what the market saw is a divergence in production hardware started to be manufactured by certain companies and software per se started becoming a whole market in itself and there were new players in the market who focus only on the creation of softwares microsoft being a huge player in the market so the realization that you have a market for software alone and particularly application software which is not which are not related to particular computers led to the realization that such a market needs to be protected and the people who invest in such market needs to be protected uh, leading to the need for its protection now the protection basically uh, in 1971 we would see the united nations actually which means that there was an impact felt at the global level not just domestic but at the global level where the united nations requested the wipo to make a study to understand how computer programs and their related documents it was basically the written program and the algorithm to see to what extent they can be protected and whether a an international treaty itself is required for the protection of computer programs apart from the uh, other treaties that wipo was looking into at that point of time uh, keep in mind uh, at that point of time wipo was majorly looking only into two treaties one is the bern convention uh, for protection of literary and artistic works and the other being the paris convention for the protection of industrial property so the uh, the agenda per se was that is there a need for a new treaty just to 
look into and take into consideration the protection of computer programs and they had identified different rationales as to why it had to be protected computer programs per se and the first and the most interesting rationale is that investment and time that is required in the creation you require quite a lot of money and quite a lot of time in generating a computer program but at the same time it could be copied pretty fast it was extremely vulnerable in that sense it could be very easily copied so unlike the other forms of ip which priorly protected for example be the industrial property and copyright regime in general the primary rationale was never to protect investment but here the first rationale identified becomes the protection of investment and the kind of development the probable development the technology has the technology was very nascent then it was 1971 and then there was a discussion internationally even when the technology has not developed to the extent that we see today in that sense and the concerns the idea was that when we look into existing regimes the only regimes capable of protecting copyright was uh, uh, computer programs was copyright on the one side patent on the other side and trade secrets on the third side and each of these systems have their advantages and disadvantages i presume that um, you had a discussion on all these forms of ip Uh, particularly from the computer program point of view what happens is copyright will come into come into detail when we looking into the indian law copyright protect gives a very long protection but not a very strong protection patent on the other hand gives a short term protection so only uh, at that point of time countries varied in uh, patent term protection it was usually 14 some countries 7 some countries 20 but it was a very short period of protection compared to copyright but it was a very strong protection also when you compare it with copyright and then you had trade secret trade secret gave you an absolute protection in perpetuity as long as uh, the proprietor is able to maintain a secrecy and the problem or the concern with a uh, trademark one of the concerns with trademark was that it would hamper the growth of the technology because everyone who creates a computer program if it's trade secret would hold it in secret and the second person would have to start from one so it was trade secret requires you to reinvent the wheel many times so from the technological development point of view trade secrets was not much um, advised so though these established forms of intellectual property was there the initial wipo study supported by the un was that there should be a sui generis mechanism because computer programs is not something which can be squarely protected under patents copyright or trade secrets everything has its benefit but they also had certain disadvantages when we look from the protection of the computer program uh, panel but uh, countries uh, the whitford committee report is by the united kingdom and the contour report is by the us so simultaneously or immediately when the report came from wipo suggesting a, a sui generis mechanism outside copyright countries where the technology was in development they put their own commissions into study to look as to how computer programs can be looked into Uh, it is, for example, Contour is not restricted to computer programs per se. They were looking into technological changes. Uh, the Repographic Machine was also an uh, element of study of Contour. So basically, each country, the the countries which had or were generating quite a lot of computer programs at that point of time, did look into, and they were under the uh, conclusion that it needs to be protected under the copyright regime uh, because it was best from the technological development point of view or the program technology development point of view it's best that copyright protects it it gives quite a lengthy protection and more than the lengthy protection copyright always for uh, permits further creativity 
so it was generally understood that if programs are protected within the copyright regime the boost it would give to the industry would be much more than patent and trade secrets and that is why most countries came to the conclusion that it's best to go with the copyright regime and we see this reflection that happened domestically in uh, these countries uk had the same stand uh, us had the same stand subsequently uh, european union also took up the same stand that copyright is the most appropriate forum but then uh, when the international law was being international law on ip was being negotiated trips also took up the same stand that computer programs should be treated as a copyright subject matter and it specified that computer programs be it in source, source code or open code which means that the high level language or the lower level language the machine readable or the human readable whichever be the way in which the computer programs express it has to fall within the copyright regime so internationally the obligation of every country who party to trips including india is to protect computer program within the copyright regime so that is a, so the question is how we comply with that obligation now uh, under indian law it's interesting to note that the protection of computer program uh, started during the time we were negotiating trips itself so even before trips was finalized and came into effect there was a, a changes or amendments being brought into the indian law uh to introduce computer programs as part of literary work and then there were slight modifications in 1999 so the law as we see today uh we the definition shows that computer programs are part of a literary work which is actually under the indian law the broadest category of work that we have and computer programs have been defined it's computer program that is being protected not the category of software as such so individual programs get copyright and each program it's understood as a set of instructions uh, and it also says that including a machine readable medium which means the trips requirement of object code and source code both are being met out under the indian law so even if you write a program in c++ or java and then when the computer converts it into the binary system in both those formats a computer program is being protected as a literary work and now uh, sorry in a computer program we have both the source code and object code both getting protection which means a third party is stopped from using in any way uh, the rights we'll come back to those rights the rights given by copyright it cannot be exercised by any party without the consent of the creator even uh, in whichever format both the source code and the object code but the uh, the catch of copyright law or the beauty of copyright law is that copyright do not protect ideas and it only protects expressions so the functionality so if um the purpose of writing a program is to create a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet having a function where addition and subtraction can be done within the spreadsheet that is the idea but then the writing of that program of how to create that spreadsheet and uh, when you have the spreadsheet you also need to keep in mind there's a user interface program is being written or to be protected and not the idea behind it and this is the general notion of copyright that idea is not protected and only expressions are protected and those expressions has to be original that it originates from the author or the creator now what the law initially tried and what the law even today is trying to bring in this general notion of copyright law and applying it to a technology which is essentially created to do a function so every computer program is functional you don't write a computer program unless and until you want to make the computer do a function so it is in that context we need to understand what is idea as far as a computer program is concerned and what is expression now uh, the jurisprudence evolved in the us and the jurisprudence has acts has been accepted by our country but you will not find a lot of litigation per se particularly in copyright regime 
related to computer programs you have one or two very basic uh, judicial pronouncements which recognizes both uh, the system software uh, the source code and the uh, object code as the um, copyright protectable subject matter so this test which is commonly called the altai test this is something which is used today to identify and distinguish idea from expression now uh, to uh, students of copyright law uh, or those who are interested in copyright law you must understand that in every written material you find to take written material as an example or any kind of work that has a copyright you must understand the idea and expression both are there and they are mixed together for example the presentation that i am making now the slides that i have written down and you are seeing now it is also having copyright and the idea and expression here is also merged my idea is to explain as to how computer programs are protected and the idea is be expressed written down arranged explained in a particular manner so this notion of idea and expression they always go together and as a, a copyright student it becomes a, a practically a very tedious task to separate them because it's only the expressions that get the protection now with related to programs uh, to uh, work other than computer programs you can say it might be comparatively easier practically it is not let me assure you if you try to find it out it's quite dif difficult but when we are talking about computer programs it becomes much more difficult to identify or to separate this idea and expression now the test has been laid down by the us court and it's it's a triple test called abstraction filtration and comparison so uh the stage is called like the name states it's called abstraction now abstraction is a very tedious task and uh, keep in mind this is being done by the judge when he is determining whether a program has a, has been infringed or not like all of us might be knowing copyright has is being conferred per se without formalities in most countries it is because simply the creation of the work you would get a copyright so there is the dispute comes up in questions of infringement so to find out if there is an infringement that is why you have the comparison part at the end so before finding out if a, a program has been infringed the court first need to identify what are the protectable elements of a pro, a particular program and so this test is actually being done by a judge the first stage of abstraction like uh, let me first uh, take an analogy from a non program example and then try to bring it to computer programs uh, let's take a, a a novel or a movie uh, i'm just taking the example of two states as a novel probably i hope at least some of you would have read if not i hope some of you have seen the movie and if you haven't seen the movie or read the novel is also okay because there are a thousands of movies in the same line uh, particularly in indian films in regional language also you will have the essence is you have uh, a boy or a girl there's a it's a love story basically you have a boy and a girl and they are coming from different cultural backgrounds so you have from north or south or east or west but essentially they are from different cultural background and because of this cultural difference uh, the parents are not agreeable to their relationship and uh, the parents create their own drama and there are two possible endings one is that parents don't agree and they part or the parents agree and they wed so this this is a normal scenario that you see this is a very basic outline of a story okay so this is the idea alone now this can be expanded it can the same idea can be elaborated and written in like 10 pages it can be elaborated and written in 200 pages it can be elaborated and made a whole script and made a movie so when you are given a novel 
take any novel to two states or harry potter any novel you have read and try to compress the novel the no the full original novel is the abstraction is actually a pyramid okay the the whole written express novel is the base of the pyramid it can't be bigger than that but you can narrow it down abridge it without losing its essence you can abridge it abridge it abridge it to the smallest unit which is the peak of the pyramid so you can abstract it and stop at any level of abstraction these are called different levels of abstraction so at the peak it's a mere idea harry potter is a boy who understands who has magical powers and goes to a magical school and tries to save the world the world from a evil magician so that could be the pin the point or the pinnacle of the pyramid which is the shorter form the idea can be expressed and the longest form is of the expression are the seven novels that jk rowling has written down so in between anywhere the work could be abstracted to find out what is the idea and what is the expression unfortunately there is no clear cut guideline as to in how big is this pyramid or where in this pyramid is the line where ideas stop and expressions begin so you the first problem that practically we find is abstraction in how to abstract but theoretically yes you have a, a let's say 10 different ways in which the work can be expressed and you identify a, a particular way which you think is the way where idea stops and it's solely expressions and from those expressions from that point of abstraction from the expressions that you note there you have to remove quite a lot of elements the elements some of it are also available in non computer program scenario also what you call as mergers so even if it is it is your expression if it is a merger you cannot uh, consider it for a copyright infringement for example it could be a way of uh, a, a structure uh, like playing chess you can't have a chess board in multiple ways you can have a chess board only in one particular way it is a merger merger are situations where you can't express in quite a lot of ways there is minimal number of ways in which you can express the phone a telephone directory being arranged alphabetically is a merger so even if i have done it it is not though ex my expression it won't get a protection because of the situation of merger similarly any situation of merger that comes in a computer program has to be excluded the other the second part are what is called as elements dictated by external factors and this is something which is quite a lot available with computer programs for example there are syntaxes if you are writing your program in c or c++ you have a format where you there's a particular symbol like s and you say print f so that is a format you have to give if the system has to function so there are mechanical specifications you have to write in those syntaxes if your software has or if your program has to work then that part of the program has to be filtered out similarly are certain elements of what makes the computer program interoperable so elements they are like lock and keys if i write a program and if it has to run with window in in windows my so my program need to be compatible with windows for which i might have to take certain element that are there in windows to make these compatible such parts of a program also has to be filtered out similarly if there are practices in the pro in the industry such practices has to be filtered out any element taken from public domain has to be filtered out it's after filtering out all these elements whatever is remaining is what your expression as a creator which could get protected and the question is are those expressions copied so that is the comparison part so though theoretically this test is very simple of abstraction filtration and comparison 
practically identifying this becomes extremely tedious so once you have identified the part that you have created which has copyright these are the rights that are available it's provided under section 14b basically it's seen as a uh, offshoot of literary work itself so you have all the rights of literary work and in addition to that there is rental right so um, and rental right is a right which the manufacturers of softwares use the most uh, now all of us are using quite a lot of softwares we would have installed quite a lot of softwares we would have bought antivirus we would have downloaded antivirus and made payment when we bought the softwares also we made payment but i doubt how many of us have looked into the agreement when we are downloading there is a, a click wrap agreement we click i agree and we download the if software if we are buying a software it comes with a a shrink wrap agreement there's an agreement on the cover of it there would be an agreement in bill most of us do not read it we are under the impression that we are buying the software buying at in the sense there is a transfer of ownership legally what we are talking about but unfortunately that is not the situation every software that we buy it is not actually buying it's only a rental so every time you are agree you are agreeing for a rental your anti virus softwares you they are actually renting it to you for one year the microsoft uh, the os that you are using the uh, microsoft office that you are using the apps that you are downloading all those are basically rentals which means that in no situation does actually the right holder permit a transfer of ownership on that single piece of software that you are buying so that is how they make the market out of it so they have a other programmer not essentially the programmer the person who is holding the rights of the computer program has the control the financial control over the program basically through rental and uh, another thing that needs to be understood is that i have not added the provision under our indian law under section 17 of the act there is a provision a sub provision which says that if a work is made in the course of employment it belongs to the employer so most uh, it companies when they ask their employees to write programs for them the copyright is automatically vested on the employers but then there are undoubtedly independent programmers and they have the option like all the apps that you see the games they might be created independently even when created independently they might be and in 99% of the situations they are practically encashed not directly but by selling it to large corporations and then coming to us so the games that you see uh, that you usually download from a uh, play store would also be attached to certain companies and they they there are famous companies themselves like king.com etc they are basically gaming companies so the right is basically rental and that is how the work is controlled and also monetized but then again being a literary work the author of the computer program the originator or the programmer also has a moral right now uh, just because computer program puts in a lot of investment and time does not mean that as a consumer as a user i don't have any rights my rights as a user for computer programs are very specific it's not under the general provisions there are specific provisions under section 52 which are basically rights of users and it says that for whatever purpose i have bought the software to ensure that i meet it i can make copies i can use the like if i am a programmer and i have created a new program and i want to make it compatible with my windows os and then i need to find out what are the elements of windows os that would make my uh, software compatible or interoperable so i can tamper with the windows software to find out the elements of interoperability i can study the windows software or study observe learning to identify how it works 
and the last one make copies for non commercial purposes that is something which is actually legal for example when a, a, a antivirus is sold to you you will find a single usage antivirus or a triple which means it can be used in three systems but then practically today most of us have multiple systems and in a home there would be more than three systems so the question is if you buy a triple usage antivirus can you tamper it using this ex exception because you are uh, uh, undoubtedly it's a non commercial person so i have five computers but then the antivirus available is only for three computers so i have to buy either for six computers or i have to buy for three so can i buy for three and tamper it and ensure that i use it for five of course i am also violating a contract which i entered with you so these questions theoretically remain unfortunately we have not seen any cases or any judicial interpretations as to how our judiciary would appreciate the users rights particularly in the context of computer programs so this is one area where you have programs very strongly protected and the term of protection is life plus 60 years which most programmers think are redundant because no computer program would have a a market which into which would be so long the longevity of a computer program is comparatively very small unless it's such a breakthrough so this is one area where computer programs are protected both system softwares as well as application softwares are very clearly protected but like i said this is a weak protection because there are quite a lot of uh, users rights possible might we might be exercising we might not be exercising i'm not sure why we do not have litigation but comparatively weaker so the question is most companies because it's a weak protection for a very long time the companies would love to protect it under patent regime which is comparatively a very strong uh, system of protection and this was realized by at the time when the laws were being made itself and computer uh, software as a uh, market was booming it was realized experiences from other countries for sure we realized that there is a uh, an attempt to protect computer software through patent and the patent law basically requires that the product has to be new it should be a product or a process it has to be new inventive and capable of industrial application but the catch the point for notice the catch hold is that under section 3 there is a specific entry in the indian law which says that computer programs per se cannot be patented it was introduced in the 2002 amendment when the patent act was modified uh, to suit the needs of the trips regiment and this is also in compliance with the trips law because trips required copyright to be the appropriate forum to protect computer programs there was this apprehension was strong grounded it's not that we thought that people would come but there was strong evidence from other countries particularly us of a number of instances where inventor or programmers were trying to get the benefit of patent regime and develop what is called as a software patent regime you might be familiar with the cases gotchak versus benson and parker versus fluke uh, now both these cases what we need to commonly understand is that when we are writing a program to make the computer do something it is something that we as human beings are capable of doing and we know to do so it's something that is being done manually is being converted to be done mechanically that is what most computer programs do for example addition subtraction having a spreadsheet to do it but then uh, if you enter the data in a excel sheet you can add uh, the data of thousand students in like a split second you will get the information but if a human being is trying to do a thousand students data entry or uh, total marking and finding the average it's going to take quite a lot of time so like i said earlier is the ease of conducting our lives that makes software so dear to us so it's this realization that uh, it that it is not something that is fresh or absolutely new that the program or the software is doing 
it's something which had been done by human beings manually that is being done mechanically so in both the cases the activities we were being done manually and then you created a software to do to make the computer do it and the courts in both the cases held that they cannot be patented but the turn of events happened with this seminal case called diamond versus dyer now here the problem was it was processing rubber and the technology prior to this was each time if the manufacturer had to identify that the uh, rubber was cured to the precise time the the uh, the hardware was there the hardware had to be opened and the temperature had to be checked so while opening there used to be quite a lot of um, accidents happening because it was very high temperature that was what the uh, inventor did is here is that he put in a uh, a thermometer which can read the temperature and this was connected to a a, a, a machine a computer which would be constantly reading this temperature and maintaining the temperature so that the correct temperature is always maintained and can identify had to when the product has been cured so this in between uh, part of opening and checking could have been done away with so this was the technological change that was brought about by uh, the invention of the uh, the person who claimed the patent here uh it went to the courts and the court said that yes there was a a software attached but simply because the presence of a a program doesn't mean that the whole invention becomes unpatentable what had to be looked into is the invention as a whole so when they looked into the invention as a whole it was found that it's the uh, american law it was a new manner of manufacture that was the language of the uh, american sta statute so it was understood that yes there was a problem prior to this and the problem was effectively taken care of by this invention which is undoubtedly a human intervention and just because there was a software present that doesn't make an otherwise patentable invention unpatentable and patent was granted so this is one of the instances where keep in mind the patent was not for the program per se it was for the hardware which had one of its elements as a software so it was a machine as a whole but then part of the machine ran because of that software and the success of the machine was also because of this software so after this there has been quite a lot of a uh, huge boom in us regarding to software patents and one of the niche areas that developed is business method patents as to how to conduct business and there are multiple cases where patents have been granted particularly from the circuit courts most of these cases did not go to the supreme court most of these cases came only up to the circuit courts which are the equivalent of our high courts and ended up getting a patent and in this particular case uh, the only requirement was there should be a tangible result and of course every software would give you a tangible result so applying this uh, test quite a lot of uh, softwares did get patented but when it came to bilsky versus kapos this went up to the supreme court okay now uh, here the it was actually regarding a hedge funding predicting of risk on buying a commodity or a share now if you are some of you might be uh, share trading so if you as a human being have been watching the market for quite some time it could be share it could be commodity whichever is the market but if you are a observant participant of the market you can predict in course of time the risk associated with each commodity or each share but what the the software did was when the once the data is entered it will predict what is the risk of buying a share or a commodity so that was the software that was invented and because of the earlier decision the state street decision uh, the patent office gave the patent it went on to it was challenged it went on to appeal uh, it, it was infringed and then there was a challenge of patent and then went it to appeal to um, 
circuit court the circuit court also said there is patent but then it came to the supreme court when it came to the supreme court of the united states the supreme court said there has to be either there must be a machine like the earlier situations that we saw in dia uh, diamond versus dyer where you have a machine or an apparatus and the machine is new and then as the software is attached to that machine then you are getting a patent not for the software but for the machine but the software is a part of it attached to it so that is one instance where a softwares could be patented the other is there should be a transformation of the particular article so this transformation court said that the transformation that a machine do i as a human being i can do if it it is the same result that the machine is doing but its quantity would be much higher i can do might be 10 transfer 10 conversions a day the machine might be able to do 10000 that cannot be under that cannot be seen as a transformation there should be a cogent difference between what a human being would be able to do and the machine would be able to do there should be a a a visible transformation on the result that the machine is able to predict or come out with and the supreme court uh, revoked the patent that was given in this particular case saying that this this is something that a human being can do just because you have a um, algorithm or a, a software to do it much faster probably much more efficient simply doesn't mean that it deserves a patent and the supreme court was very critical about the uh, patent office issuing patent saying that patent is to recognize the genius but the situation uh, did not much change we have the case of uh, alice corporation versus clrs bank again in this case again uh, the court did not give a patent it had to go to the court because you see the patent office giving patent and again a uh, 2014 case ddr holdings again here it's the lower courts uh, again ending up recognizing patents for business method uh, here again the court saying that it's not simply a business method but it actually has a technological impact and most of these cases like i said do not go up to the supreme court but federal courts uh, there are some courts just like in india you can identify the judicial trend there are federal courts which are pro it and most of these go to such courts that they end up getting a patent but coming back to the indian law so it is this international this is the international situation at least the situation us that prevails that for quite a lot of uh, softwares they end up with getting patented but when under the indian law still the law says that for computer program per se there cannot be a patented but to get patented in india even if it is a software the same uh, parameters have to be dealt with like any other invention it has to be new there has to be an inventive step and there must be a uh, utility or uh, industrial application along with an enabling disclosure now these are all the elements that are available with every other uh, invention just being applied to patents also now the uh, the trick of the law is the term computer program per se so it clearly says that mathematical and business met or business methods so no mathematical or business method can be patented at all but computer program per se uh, in when in, initially introduced it was only computer programs or algorithms when it went to the joint parliamentary committee this term per se was added the understanding of jpc was then computer programs is a extremely growing area so there could be a lot of hap things happening in the future so today we understand program as only a probably a system software something Uh, which is not particularly designed for any unique system it runs across system so in such situation is, is what we understand computer program today but it need not be so tomorrow so that is why jpc added the term per se suggesting that if it's merely a computer program then it shall not be patent protected which means the rightful regime is copyright
but this opened the flood gate to show that certain kinds of computer programs could be patented so if it's not a per se computer program then there is a scope of patenting this is the understanding that the statute gave now uh, when we look into the patent manual the initial manual is on uh, 2011 this also particularly says that it's if it is only a computer program then it cannot be patented but if it is a computer program that comes together with a, a hardware because you can have hardwares which runs on which have computer program associated in such situations it is possible so this is only the manual and manual is only for the working of the patent office it is not something that actually uh, binds you and me it's just an office guideline so to us the law remains that computer program per se cannot be patented and then to clarify the issue because this created quite a lot of havoc in the uh, patent office itself quite a lot of guidelines have been drafted time and again guidelines have been drafted and uh, these uh, 2013 2017 guidelines are accepted guidelines of 2017 so it's called CRI guidelines, guidelines on computer related inventions of 2017. So that is one document which gives us some clarity or creates quite a lot of confusion as to what kinds of softwares can be protected in India. Now, uh, when we look into the 2017 guidelines, you will also see that uh, 2019 manual also has attached the same guidelines. So it says that the focus of the invention should be taken into consideration. The invention as such and not the way it is claimed. Because when lawyers write it, lawyers are very crafty. Our bread and butter lies in the way we draft. So we might draft it very creatively that it might not look anything like a computer program. That what is claimed does not look like a computer program. So the guideline is very clear to find out, irrespective of the way it has been claimed, look into what is the underlying substance of that invention. And it further clarifies that if the claim is in form of a method, process, apparatus, etc., it should not be patentable. However, if the substance of the claim taken as a whole does not fall into this excluded category, patent should not be denied. So if it's, it uses again the term method or process, quite clear. But even if there is an apparatus or dev a device, if it falls in the excluded category, there cannot be a patent. But when you look at the substance, the invention as a whole, if the invention falls outside this category, so you are actually invented something which is not a program, but the program is a part of it. In such situation, patent should be governed. So this is the same approach that we find with the, uh, at least with one part of the uh, US decision of Bilski versus Kapos. And there is also a requirement that to look into if there is a technical nature involved leading to technical advancements. Now here the question, uh, it again creates quite a lot of uh, ambiguity as to how to understand, as to whether the technical advancement should be because of the computer program or should the invention as such be te have technical advancement, which obviously is the requirement for that invention to get a patent. But then there are strict guidelines saying that if anything is claimed directly as business method, it should not be given a patent. Business method is absolutely excluded from 3K. Okay. 3K directly says that if it's a business method, it cannot get a patent. So any claim, be it a business method, it's claimed so you will not get. Even if it is not claimed so, uh, the third point, it says that if it is essentially about carrying a business or financial activity or trading or selling goods in web, which is done using actually softwares, none of this can be patented. And 
uh, again these things cannot be patented it has been specifically written down in the guidelines that are computer uh, that claims directed at programs per se set of instructions routes or subroutines uh, databases memory with instructions if any of these terms are presented in those claims those claims would be rejected keep in mind it's only those claims are rejected but still the whole invention could end up with getting a patent but these claims would be rejected because they are directed so at computer program per se which cannot be at all part of the patent regime and we have uh, a couple of cases initially pretty clear in that sense uh, the more and more we uh, the technology changes the more and more complex we see the judicial decisions also becoming now uh, the initial case was yahoo versus redf which was for a search engine and the courts were very clear that it cannot be patented and uh, ipab decided that it cannot be patented but uh, when it came to ericsson versus intel this is a it's a huge litigation this is only one of the uh, applications interim applications it's actually uh, on a a standard essential patent and the standard essential patent has software in uh, inbuilt now um, um, most of us are familiar with ericsson and intel ericsson is a huge giant in uh, phone manufacturing area not uh, we might not see them quite in market they are very high in r&d so they create these technologies and they have quite a lot of technologies created on 2g 3g now 4g and they are very high on 5g innovations also so uh, the case was on 2g and 3g technologies that is inbuilt to our mobile phones and these technologies of uh, the data transfer the voice control and voice transfer those technologies were under dispute here and all those technologies are done using softwares the clarity of the voice that is getting transmitted from me sitting in cochin and you sitting in other parts of the country the quality is ensured because of the it, now it's uh, internet data and the bandwidth bandwidth but uh, in 2g and 3g it was the mobile network data mobile network so those were the technology that ericsson had and uh, again to facilitate these technology because they are built into handsets mobile phones of course there were softwares involved and the court because it's an interim application the court did not have to give a final say there it was of the opinion that just because there is a software involved does not mean it falls outside the purview of patent subsequently uh, it was recognized that ericsson hold these patents we have a whole issue of standard essential patents as to whether it should be made available to intex or not so again the patent which are related to this hardware was being recognized and correctly so we fall in line with other jurisprudence also but this case this was decided in 2020 july and the high court observation in 2013 again is an interim petition which went to the delhi high court now here um, alani the the patentee the plaintiff the person who invented the technology he found a technology which is commonly called as effective search strategy it's it's a search engine which uses or it's a search engine technique which uses minimal bandwidth so you are able to use multiple uh screens together because your bandwidth for your search is minimal and your retrieval time is much much higher so that's why it's called a effective search strategy and uh, initially the patent was not given and he was not uh, when the patent was rejected he was not actually given a hearing and he wanted a hearing per se so when it was rejected without giving him a hearing he went and challenged the order to the delhi high court and that is the case in 2013 where the delhi high court ordered to give him a hearing before taking the decision and in that case also the delhi high court observed that uh, quite a lot of inventions today are coming are based on computer programs so simply because there is a computer program uh, the patent office should not take the stand that it would be patent ineligible and to hear the party and then decide accordingly so the observation is from a interim petition and then this went back to the controller and the controller heard the party 
and uh, the controllers were still of the opinion that it is not patentable because there is no machine attached to this particular device. And the question is, without machine attached, could there be a possibility of a patent? But when it came to IPAB, uh, the Intellectual Property Appellate Board, the Appellate Board said that there is a significant technical contribution. So, uh, particularly in the rate of retrieval of data, as well as the multiple usage or the uh, multi usage of uh, screens, because your search is taking only a very minimal bandwidth. So, this was not something that humans could do. This is something which only the software could do, bringing down the bandwidth but still ensuring that the search is effective. So the court here said that there's significant technical contribution. And one more thing needs to be noted is that when the case was being decided, it was the 2013 computer-related uh, inventions guidelines. CRI guidelines 2013 was the one the courts were relying on, not the 17 one, okay. So under the 13, the court looked into and saw the possibility that there need not be a machine attached. So even without a machine, there could be a software which is capable of patenting. And that was the holding. And the patent was granted by IPAB. This was not further challenged by the state, which means that in this situation, they received a patent for the software not linked to a machine, but which has a technical contribution, which can be done only by the software and not a human being. But this happened only in 2020, but that is not the first case where softwares have been granted patent in India. I've just picked up one or two where uh, all these are softwares which are not related to any machine. The, uh, the patents that Punjab National Bank has is to assess the credit risk and credit score checking of a client before entering into a business transaction with a client. So the question remains as to whether these kinds of patents need to be given uh, or these kinds of inventions, should we, should we call them as invention within the patent regime and give them patent? It's not that they are not being given, they are being given practically. Because some of them even do not have a technical application. For example, the Punjab National Bank checking of credit score is not something which the computer alone can do. The computer can do or the software can do it very fast because it can retrieve data from multiple platforms and multiple places and, and in a split second your credit score can be assessed. But that is something a human being can also do. Gather all the data and assess the credit worthiness of a, con a customer. So in India practically we see a lot of situations where without a system, an associated system, and even without technical applications as such, there are patents being granted by the patent office, most of them not being challenged at the judicial level. So what are the advantages as opposed to copyright? Now copyright, we know it is there. But then from an entrepreneur's point of view, for his portfolio, having patents make much more sense than having copyrights. Copyright. So that is the reason why the entrepreneurs patents over programs and softwares than remaining with copyrights. Because in patents, you do not find the kind of user's rights that you see under Section 52 under the Copyright Act. So the right is almost absolute as far as patent is concerned. Uh, that, that is the the reason and having a patent like I said enhances the portfolio of the company so uh, it brings in large investment also when you show it in your portfolio as a huge asset but the disadvantage is uh, on the one side the law has huge ambiguity where you have an office working in one line not very significant judicial pronouncements coming out so as a student of patent law, as a student of IP, you have an understanding that software is supposed to be protected under copyright, but practically you see quite a lot of softwares being protected under patent, 
and without any specific rationale as to why some is protected and why some is not and it also creates a huge problem of violation of competition law because the software that belongs to the punjab bank uh, software of assessing credits uh, all banks today do that they assess the credit worthiness of the consumer or the client before entering into a uh, a business transaction with them and every bank and financial institution should be permitted to do this so granting a patent on probably one of the effective methods you can't say that it's again asking for reinventing the wheel and reinventing a different wheel because every other bank has to have their own softwares to find the credit worthiness because punjab national bank got a patent over it now it had been copyrighted it would have been much easier just that that same software could not be used but a like software could have been uh, managed by other companies so there are advantages and disadvantages and this becomes uh, very very significant in the world that we are living and slowly moving forward but the world of what is called as internet of things and artificial intelligence internet of things and artificial intelligence works on softwares you have softwares and programs who are who have intellect as good as you and i have they are able to create new things they are able to take data analyze data uh, through creation of the sensors that you use it can be used for automated vehicles home automation wearable technology most of us use this the wearable technology to find out our heartbeat or how much we exercise per day how much we walk per day the information is transmitted the, take the example of fitbit the fitbit which is in my hand information is transferred to my phone uh, the from my phone is transferred to the fitbit server or directly from fitbit to its server the information is sent to me via mail all of our uh, hardware are getting linked using software it's all software that's doing the question is undoubtedly we need to protect them uh, when it comes to automated vehicles you don't have a driver the vehicle self drives you have unmanned uh, vessels today uh, unmanned ships today so it is all working on technology built in by software and essentially there's huge huge market and undoubtedly the business interest needs to be taken care of but the business interest also includes the interest to ensure that there is adequate competition having in the market happening in the market so we can have uh, quite a lot of products coming out simultaneously and not ending up creating huge monopolies so it's essential to protect computer programs but there is no clear cut answer as to how or which is the best method or mechanism of doing this so theoretically we are sticking with copyright practically we seen quite a lot of patents being granted and truly there is quite a lot of uncertainty being created for students like us when we try to look into how practically or which is the best way to protect computer programs so that brings in the end of my presentation now i request uh, the chair professor professor jibinetti sir to please uh, continue the proceedings uh, thank you so much ma'am in fact uh, it has been uh, quite a learning experience and uh, right from the conceptual understanding of the software and uh, computer program till the latest developments in the field starting with the us decisions then the indian decisions including farid alani's case i think uh, all the participants have got immensely benefited by attending your you know thank you so much on behalf of dpiit chair and on my personal behalf and i hope that in future also you would be obliging us on many more occasions because ipr is one such area where we require constant you know sharing of this knowledge and uh, thank you so much now over to mr srinivas rao for a formal vote of thanks thank you thank you sir uh, thank you ma'am uh, today i am privileged to host this uh, vote of thanks uh, it was an interesting technology embedded lecture uh, madam you have taken us
to the technology learning days by discussing various case studies and briefing on concepts on monitors, multiplexers, search engines, bandwidth, latency, and ultimately software. So not only me, ma'am, but we have a members base today from uh, not only from academia, but also from software, technology, telecommunications, and banking domains. So you have appropriately addressed them by taking uh, greater examples of banking software. And I would also like to thank you for gracing our event, which has created uh, impact on dissemination of IPR knowledge. And thank you for being the part of this historical moment in this week 14th series, which is known as Know Your IP weekly lecture series. Uh, every week, ma'am, eminent people like you participate in this meet and encourage us to take more challenging and more enduring tasks in the field of IPR. So coming to copyrights and software, it has always been confusing for the people out of IPR domain. And today you have cleared those concepts related to idea expression and the dichotomy in between them. And also clarified the methods and the processes and the conditions under which the software can be patented. So we are looking for more sessions from you, ma'am. Uh, as I know that you are a very good resource topic of uh, GIs. As I was the part of uh, last to last week uh, lecture, which has been delivered at MNLU Nagpur. So I got an opportunity to hear from you. So that was a very good lecture. So um, coming to the participants, we will meet again uh, yet another interesting topic. Until next episode, on behalf of DPIT IPR Chair, thank you. See you again.